How do you choose a pig? Well, I would start off with a weather forecast. A reliable weather forecast with the wind direction and wind speed. I want to choose I want to choose whether to sit with the wind in my face all day slightly uncomfortable but with the added chance of catching big carp or a sheltered spot a more relaxed day and still the chance of a carp dividing the lake up into north south east and west banks I would decide on an area that suits my chosen day's fishing time of year time of day would also play a part in it On arriving at the lake, as I approach in the car, I can see where other people are fishing. And this might influence me because I don't want to be crowding them or them crowding me. There's no point when there's plenty of other days to come back and fish that spot. Northwest corner of the lake is one of my favourite spots. And the east bank is also a favourite spot at the, the lower end of the east bank near the shower blocks for the caravan site. It faces the willow tree. I've had many a big camp from around this area. So, when you get to the lake, give yourself a chance to do some reconnaissance. Watch where the wind is taking the surface. Know that if you sat on the north bank you're going to have the sun in your face overhead throughout most of the day and it's going to be a pleasant day's fishing and by pleasant I mean relaxing and taking in what's happening on the lake So that's how I choose a pig. What is the first thing I do at the pig? Park up quietly, stand back from the lake edge 
and take in the surroundings. Many a time I've arrived at a peg when there's been carp right at the edge. They're not always catchable, it's nice to see them and it's nice to know that they're there. So, looking at your chosen peg, checking the margins, checking what's out in front of you, just taking all of the lake's beauty in. Look for clues of carp rising. Look to see what wildlife is about because they are going to be competing with the carp for any bit you put on the surface. But more of that later. So, and I suppose I always take a photo of the peg. Firstly, to help make a video log of the day, but secondly, just to remind me what the circumstances and conditions were like. What order do I set up my fishing gear? If we talk in cameras then I sometimes set a camera up on a tripod and record my setup. It can make an interesting time lapse as an introduction to the day. And I've filmed fish being caught or fish rising, fish jumping. So at what point do you set the camera up? Well, that's up to you, but I like to film everything. So I set it going and then carry on setting up my gear. The fishing gear, in order priority, is my two nets, a large net and a slightly smaller net. They're always set up and put by the lakeside. Then any seat or seat box I'm currently using, a director's chair with attachments on the arms. So I would set that up. A spare bead filled um, unhooking mat at my feet for smaller fish that I may catch and release quickly. And then I would go about setting up my unhooking cradle, which includes the scales, camera tripod, forceps, a little bowl of water, and my catch and release cradle. It could be used for weighing but it's also very useful for manhandling large grass carp and releasing any large carp 
back into the lid. Then I would set up my three rods, two of which I will use and one will be set up as a spare because you don't want to waste time if you catch a snag, break a hook link, snag a tree, have a snap off. You don't want to waste any time if you think the fish are feeding. Common setup is two thick rigs and I'll mention them in detail later and one free line and that's my third and spare rod. My bag of bits and pieces and my hook length box go on the side tray and to the right side of the director's chair. Then I would bait up, cast out, set the rods against the rod rests Put the anti reverse on, engage the bait runners, place the butts of the rods on the floor so the rod tips are high, resting against the feeder arm with the tips high so I can see any nodding or bites. And then I would set up my camping stove and get the kettle on for a cup of tea. <laughs> Am I interested in what other anglers are doing? Yes, I take an interest. If they're all reeling in fish, then I know it's going to be a bumper day. If they're bivvied up, with the entrance zipped up, then I wonder whether they've had a busy night or whether they're just not bothered about taking in the watercraft that surround them. If I'm forcibly fishing a couple of pegs away from somebody then I'll work out where they're casting so I can avoid causing any disruption to their day. They might not know I'm here yet. They will do soon enough when big pieces of tiger bread slap the water and attract wildlife and the big carp. <laughs> so yes, I'm interested in what other anglers are doing. I wouldn't dream of disturbing them or asking them what they've caught fish on. That's for me to work out and enjoy. If somebody just laid out all the clues, it wouldn't be much of a puzzle, would it? So remember, fishing is finding out, working it out. Great pleasure to be had from working out how to catch that big carp 
or even bigger grass cow. Do I use bait alarms? I have done. Because I fish right next to my rods all the time. I only ever need bait alarms when I'm away from the rod side. Maybe making a cuppa. But I found ways to not need to use any alarms so that's my chosen method at the moment I, I've still got some lovely Stone Age Delkims and they've never let me down but I do like the quietness of having to be alert and spot everything so at the moment no I don't use bite alarms do I consider other wildlife Definitely. Apart from loving to watch the birds around the lake, I love to watch the wildlife on the lake. Coots and moorhens help me locate and keep awake when carp are in the area. They become my bite alarms. As you'll see from later in this video I surface fish a lot with big chunks of tiger bread zigged that's a, a weight on the lake bed, a line going vertically to the surface and then my tiger bread rig which is just two small elastic bands and a size 8 hook. The weight enables me to cast out into the lake and helps hold station so that the bread isn't drifting off station out of place to somewhere I don't want it to be. Now the wildlife of which there are ducks, occasional geese, Occasional seagulls, coots, moorhens, and chicks of all sizes and shapes. At the beginning of the season, the beginning of the year, should I say, when chicks start to be born, the chicks aren't a problem. They're too scared to approach big lumps of bread. But the parents, especially ducks, will approach it and will devour all of your bait. So having the bait zigged, I can just wind it under, below the surface, out of their reach. And when they're moved on, wind it back to the surface because I love to see a surface take. Now coots and moorhens 
aren't afraid of anything and they do love my bread <laughs> but as I said earlier they become my bite alarms if they go towards a piece of tiger bread and then turn away you can be sure there's a carp in the area if they're eating that bread and they suddenly take off like a helicopter you know a carp's tickled the toes and even if there's no carp feeding at the at that time they'll alert me to when carp move into the area carp approach bread like dog in a manger they're not bothered until somebody else wants a piece then they are bothered and that's when you see coots and moorhens suddenly change direction or take off I filmed many a carp and a moorhen or a coot battling over the bread. Now when the moorhen and coots come for the bread and they will repeatedly come backwards and forwards to feed the chicks but they don't bite off much because they, they are small creatures and I say live and let live There's, if they leave enough bread to keep the carp interested then they're welcome to have a bite or two when the mallards come that's a different kettle of fish they will consume everything including the hook so pull it out of the area or wind it under or strike quickly leave the bread in the area leave them feeding on that while you put another piece on and cast out on a side note should you ever hook a duck and I'm afraid it is a possibility when the chicks become slightly larger, more voracious and they mob your bread. If you should hook one, reel it in, unhook it and return it as safe as possible to the lake you'll see that the benefit is that they'll leave your bread alone from then on for that day certainly within their squadron but the word can go around and so it wouldn't be wrong to say there's pros and cons to hooking a duck we don't want to that's not what we go for but it does calm the rest of the flock down if you do hook one by accident and because we fish fabulous hooks the cooks the hook is easily removed from the duck and hopefully although it's a traumatic experience it doesn't affect them much so yes I consider other wildlife when I'm fishing for big carp especially grass carp do I consider other fish species yes I do if you're fishing 
mid-water you may well catch bream if you're fishing in the upper layers you may well catch roach or even hide if you're fishing on the surface you may get mobbed by hordes of silverfish but they come and go and sometimes they're attractors for carp back to this dog in the manger attitude if a carp sees somebody else is enjoying the bread then he'll have a go so yes I do consider other fish species What do you do when you catch a carp? The first indications of a carp showing interest are a rod tip bouncing. I would disengage the bait runner, lift my rod and bend into the Well, bend into the strike. If it's a grass carp, or I think it's a grass carp, bear in mind I've lost grass carp through them shedding the hook at my feet and staying in the swim for minutes, and that's soul destroying. Bear in mind that I've lost grass cap, I would always strike, set the hook rather than risk losing it, especially at my feet. Fishing with barbless hooks, you have to keep the tension on all of the time especially with grass cap and they do occasionally come towards you so we've, we've lifted the rod we've got the fish on we take it for granted that the bait runner reel line drag is set to give line before the breaking strain. All of that I do cover in how to set up a bait runner reel. You might wish to check out that video after this one. So we've lifted the rod. We've now got the choice. You can take the anti-reverse off and then you can play the fish, give line if you think it needs it, recover line which is the whole point of how to land a fish and wind it within the capabilities of your rod and reel. This isn't a hauling competition where you're using a broom shank and a scarborough reel. Hopefully you've got a nice setup. Two and a half, two and three quarters, three pound test curve carp rod, round about ten foot, and a bait runner reel possibly Shimano ST4000 or round about that model so let's say you recover in line 
you do sometimes have to just hold steady and watch the rod not away. Think of the rod as a way of guiding the car to you, out, out and away from any snags and safely through the water. If you bring it in too early, you're going to have a devil of a job landing it. If you play it forever, then it's not going to be as much fun. So a bit of practice, a bit of experience, and you know when to bring it in and when to try and land it. Once you assess what size carp it is, choose the net appropriate to it. Large nets can be cumbersome round about bushes and snags and lakeside obstacles that catch on nails and branches. So don't always reach for that extra large net. It is possible to land carp with a decent sized net and I would encourage you to have both at hand and only when you see the carp can you make a split second decision which net to go for. So presumably you've played the fish, it's showing signs of tightness and you actually land the fish by pulling it over the net and lifting the net. At this point, if you just rest the landing net so that it's higher than the water but the carp is in the net, in the water, you can then relax slightly and gather your thoughts. If you're fishing with barbless hooks, as you, you really should on Willow's Lake at the Oaks, then there's a chance you can unhook the carp easily and put your rod and reel and dangling hook safely to one side. This is where the bead filled unhooking mat comes in handy. Think of it as an interim stop between the water and the cradle. Once you've unhooked it, move to the unhooking cradle which you might still need if the unhooking is a little more taxing or the fish is larger than you care to put on bead filled unhooking mat. If you take your rod net and carp to the unhooking cradle then you've got water beside that cradle in your tub and you can pour water over the fish to keep it healthy and relax it. Unhook it if necessary with forceps and I carry two pair of forceps, one on my T 
tab side table at my chair and one at the unhooking mat. It is an overkill, they're cheap enough comparison to carp fishing as a whole. So treat yourself, treat the fish to some decent forceps to make unhooking healthy. If there's any damage by the hook then equip yourself with some carp care liquid that you dab on to any hook hold. That dries pretty quick and will mean that the carp doesn't suffer any infection. Carp care can be applied to any scrapes on the side of the carp, any damage that you see that you think carp care will help. It's antiseptic, designed for carp. Set you favourite app going on your camera or phone on the tripod and get those much needed capture photos so you can remind yourself of what a lovely fish it was. Bear in mind that the shorter the time you have the fish out of the water the better for its welfare. So have your camera gear already set up, ready to go, the app started and any self time has started. Try and compose a, a photo where your fingers aren't engulfing the fish. Take your photos if you must wait, then now's the time to wear the carp. I don't bother unless it's um, a really memorable fish. Now, the carp. Unhooking cradle has my catch and release cradle laid over it. I could it's it could also be called a weigh cradle, but the main use for me is it has handles on it so you can eventually release the carp at the lake side. A quick tip for your, those of you of the 50s generation, I've recently discovered the benefits of using a garden kneeler gadget and this has handles on the side that allow you to push up from a kneeling position to a standing position. I'll put a photo, try it, you'd be surprised how it changes your day out when you're not struggling to get to your feet from a kneeling position. I don't suppose it matters if you only catch one or two fish, but <laughs> hopefully you're going to catch a few more. You're going to nail it the unhooking cradle. Take loads of photos because you've caught loads of fish. And you're going to be able to 
go from a kneeling position to a standing position so much easier. Anyway, getting back to returning the fish in the waist sling. Take it to the water's edge. If you can, set up a camera because I love those release shots. Take the release, the waist sling back to the unhooking cradle for the next one. Stop any cameras, upload any photos to share with your friends. And then get yourself back in the chair, bait it up and cast out as soon as possible because the carp ain't going to wait around all day. And I think that's what covers on what I do when you catch a carp. How do I take photos of any catch? I have a handy cam on a tripod for the overall view of around and about the unhooken cradle. I also have an iPhone 11 on a small tripod and that's that uses an app with a self timer and I visualize where I'm going to be for the shot making sure try not to chop my head off but not too far back because I want to see all the, the detail of the car later on after returning it. So a self timer with an app and a handy cam for the overall video and that's how I take photos my catch. I do have the benefits of an Olympus OMD AM10 Mark II which produces amazing photos and that's for those special terms also when others are round about and I can ask them to take a photo but please don't rely on them as your sole memory of that classic fish you caught I've had so many passers by ruin an amazing shot with just the, I don't know, the craziness of being asked to do something technical. If you can get it wrong, they will. If they can miss a shot, they will. <laughs> don't rely on them for that once in a lifetime shot. <laughs> Do 
do I wear all the car packets? Not anymore. I'm a pretty good guesser for the weight of fish and they do come in certain lump sizes. I don't bother about ounces, pounds will do. If it's a 10 pounder it could be anywhere between 10 and 11. If it's an 18 pounder I might take more of an interest. If it's 19 I take more of an interest because I, I'm getting close to my PB then. But it's not life or death situation. So weighing is just for your own memory banks. Once you've got a load of 15 pounders, you know what one looks like compared to say 11 pounder. And you certainly know if it's a double 10 pound plus. So, no, I don't weigh all the carp I catch these days. How do I return the carp? Most common mirror ghost carp recover quite quickly from any battle so you can keep them in the margin in a net as they recover and then just lower them out of the net and out they come if you're using a smaller triangular shape net or even a pan net then lowering it in the water rotating it clockwise will literally turn the carp out of the net and allow them to swim off why do we say turn the handle clockwise well, if you turn it anti-clockwise, you are actually unscrewing the net from the handle. So it is possible to lose the net into the lake if you keep turning it anti-clockwise over and over. Be aware of that. Always turn it clockwise, which has a tendency to tighten the net on the handle. If it's a grass cap, it's going to take longer to recover. So be aware of that. If it hangs about at your feet, just watch for its recovery. Do I shout across the lake? <laughs> well, when you're at a lake, sound travels. These days, people in phones
You don't need to shout. Noise travels. If there was just myself and a pal on opposite sides of the lake, and either of us had had a memorable catch, then I suppose instead of walking round, we might shout across, well done. But as a rule, no, I would never shout across the lake. Do I ever reel in and walk around the lake? Yes, and there's a few reasons. To go to the toilet, to go to the cafe for a, a bacon buddy and a cup of tea. Willows has a super cafe, I believe it's called Acorn. They do a super breakfast or bacon sandwich or whatever you choose. They've helped me out when I've forgotten milk, tea bags gas canisters <laughs> great well walking round the lake it gives a chance to see what others are doing and whether they've had a successful day but be aware that they might not want to speak so don't force yourself on them or take over the day and certainly don't get into a competitive chat about how many you've had and such like. Share if asked, but that's all. If you're doing something that's new to them, invite them round to your swim so that it's on their terms, they come and see what you are up to. It means taking time out of your day, but I've enjoyed helping many an angler and they've told me later date it's Caught them a personal best using methods and baits, so that's rewarding. So yes, and it's also a good exercise walking around the lake. You get to see the lake throughout the day, where the carp are cruising, where the just laid up where the sunbathing, where the hiding, and you store that in the memory bank so that rather than move on that day, you might try that peg on another day. It's never wasted walking around the lake. Do I ever chat with the bailiff? I certainly do. Chris, the bailiff at Willows at the Oaks, is a mine of information and a fantastic angler. His mat match fishing prowess is legendary. The specimen cap is amazing. 
to watch him fly fish for carp occasionally is just mind blowing. He'll share any knowledge he has with the techniques. It's very encouraging. And I believe he even runs tuition days with poles on the match lakes. So yes, I would always make time and say hello to Chris. He's seen it all. Do a chat with the owner Tom. Well, Tom usually comes round taking the money for day tickets. So yes, there is an opportunity to chat with him. But he has got all these lakes to cover. So he can't spend a lot of time chatting to an old chap like me but when he has time he's a very interesting character he's a dab and up fly fishing and he likes his barbel fishing and occasional salmon fishing so he is a prolific fisherman he doesn't just talk a story, he actually does it. And of course, growing up on the complex, he's seen it develop from a single lake to the complex it is now. So he's a wealth of information, a very friendly, an unassuming guy and we do have a laugh so cheers Tom for having a fantastic fishery Do I chat with passers-by? Yes, the caravan site means that some pegs, people are going to be just walking, taking in the day at the lake. They may have just arrived or back from a day out. And Willows Lake is very picturesque, so they're drawn to it. Some may want to fish it, some may have fished it, some return year after year, which speaks volumes for the friendliness of the owners and the site facilities. I've made friends with passers-by who visited me year after year so I guess I'm easy to find Do I ever offer advice or bait to others? Only if I think they'd benefit by the knowledge or the bait. When people come to Carpfish Willows, some spend a lot on tackle and bait so they don't need my advice 
if dimensions the first time there and they are actively seeking advice then I'd proffer it. I'd also point to my other videos on my YouTube channel and some have said they've seen the videos and could I elaborate? I have offered tiger bread and zinc rigs to people who are just starting out they are interested in adopting the technique. If I had any bait left at the end of the day I may well offer people it but I wouldn't um, be too pushy because it is a personal choice. If they have seen me do well all day then they're more likely to accept it. But they do go there with set ideas of how to fish and it doesn't always include my style of surface fishing. So yes and yes is the answer. What breaking strain line do I use? Twenty three pound. That's a shock, isn't it? Certainly to you, matchmen. the years I've evolved a system where I have the least number of knots and lines joined onto lines hook lengths my hook lengths are the same as the line right through from the eye of the hook to the bottom of the reel. Does it scare the fish? Who knows? I catch plenty of carp so I can't say whether it does or not. Would I catch more? Again, I can't answer that. I've never backed to backed, and how could I? Because the variables are so many. It's almost impossible to back to back two parts of fishing and arrive at an accurate scientific answer. I believe the recommended breaking strain is over fifteen pound for willows but check on the website for the latest rules and regulations. I'll give an example of what can happen. If you join lines putting a hook link, hook link onto a heavier line you're introducing a knot which the best knot 
in fishing is probably only 80% of the breaking strain of the line. So every knot you put in reduces the breaking strain. So when you were testing your clutch setting on your reel and you pull in the line, you really should be setting it for the lowest breaking strain of the line because that's what's going to break first. Over the years I've found that that first shake of the head when a carp takes it or feels the hook that's when you can be smashed. The last thing I want to do is talk about the one that got away. If the school of thought says you're scaring fish using such heavy breaking straight line, then so be it. I would rather have that than leave a hook length in a carp's mouth because it smashed it. I saw this first hand when I was trying fly fishing one summer's evening for carp at Willows. The first night I cast and I was I was attracting the carp that were coming up for the floating mixer. They were taking mine, shaking the heads and smashing the hook then. The next night I upped the breaking strain. They were taking it, smashed shaking the head, smashed the hook length. So I wasn't catching any, I was just losing fish. Third night, I upped the breaking strain and not one come near. So I'd gone too far. So yes, they were seeing it. And that proved quite scientifically that they were affected by fly fishing line. Now I believe that free lines when they're on the surface may well be affected by the thickness and the colour and the density and the refraction of the line but I still catch a lot of carp on the surface so I'm quite prepared to catch and land those fish rather than catch and stand there in our scenic go off with my hook in its mouth and when it comes to zig fishing the line comes from my reel down to the ledger stop the two and a half ounce ledger is on the lake bed and then the line goes vertically to the surface or just below the surface and I still catch plenty of carp on this zig rig method at the surface or slightly under so again I would say 
maybe I would catch extra count, but I would much rather land the ones I do hook. So that's my choice. Yes, it is heavier than the recommended breaking strip. And I may well change in the future. What length rod do I use? <clears throat> For the past few years my three chosen rods have been ten footers 2.75 pounds breaking uh, sorry, test curve, 2.75 pounds test curve carp rods. I can cast as far as I want on Willows Lake with these 10 foot rods. I can hit the margin of any island from any peg and I've chosen to use these over and over purely for muscle memory when I pick the rod up and cast out I don't have to concentrate on everything I do. I rely on muscle memory. My old dad was an RAF marksman and he always told me it took him three shots with a rifle to get his eye in. And I tend to think similarly a couple of casts with a rod towards a far margin or a spot and then I can hit that spot all day. Just like my dad and the rifle it is wind affected but given the similar conditions once you've got your eye in muscle memory takes over and you can hit that spot consistently and that's part of my fishing success is to be able to place a bait or a ledger weight where I want to, over and over, repeatedly. What reels do I use and why? I use Shimano bait runner reels. A few years ago I had Shimano 2500s and I cast out once and nearly come to the end of the spool joint. So I'm afraid I had to up my game by 
replacement reels which held more line so I use Shimano 4000 STs bait runners they're a fantastic reel I have replaceable spools for each so that I can swap should I choose to for any reason at all but season upon season I change the line fill it up with my chosen line set the drag and off I go I love the operation of the bait runner and the anti-reverse they're not the dearest of reels but they're not the cheapest and they're not going to let you down when playing a fish Shimano bait runners my chosen What rigs do I use? When talking about surface fishing, which I do most of the time, I have what I would call a BBP bread rig. That's a line running from reel to hook with no hook links involved so there's only one knot and that's how I attach the hook to the line two small elastic bands cinched to the base of the hook and then the large piece of tiger bread just attached with the elastic bands in a cross fashion and that's for surface fishing free lined the only drawback to this is the bait will not stay in one place as long as I want it to it will be affected by the drift on the surface of the water, any wind. This can be beneficial, that drift can take you under possibly a willow tree into a more, well, fishy spot. So that's a benefit. But who's to say it's going to stop there? It might take it even deeper and end up in a snag. So free line is the most effective method of fishing bread, but it's not perfect. To help it hold station, I've designed a zigged method of this, and this uses ledger stops.
some small rubber beads, shock beads I believe they're called and a two and a half ounce or two and three quarter ounce pear lead now this combination means that I can cast as far as I want out into the lake or even to a margin on any island and it'll stay there as long as I want is it as effective as free lining? no is it the second best? a very close second it's a very very effective method to fishing because you're in the position you intended rather than being blown on the wind. If I was to fish a bottom bait then I would use a pop-up. Why a pop-up? To avoid any crayfish. And I do believe that pop-ups, or should I say wafters, possibly wafters thinking about it, very effective with a combination of a free running lead. I'm just not in favour of boat rigs. Um, I guess they work, but I'm on top of my rods all the time. I want to be able to see the bait runner working and react and strike accordingly rather than have a lead do the hooking but I fish less and less bottom baits these days so don't take what I do as gospel certainly not with bottom bits. Have a look at my bread rig and zig rig. That'll give you an idea of how I catch car. What is the best time of day to catch carp? No clues there. I fish dawn till dusk all year round I've caught carp at every hour from dawn till dusk all year round I've had days in May when I couldn't get set up fast enough and I was catching them two at a time at one part of the day and I went home shattered and if it hadn't have been for pals my army pals I 
I wouldn't have <laughs> I wouldn't have lasted as long. Most cap in a day, one May. Well, that tells you. Rather than what the best time of the day is, it's what's the best month of the year. And it has to be May for me. Now, putting that aside, what's the best time of the day? Quite a few years ago, I would have said early evening, the magic hour. These past few years, it hasn't been as prolific. It's been more spaced out during the day. I've caught loads of carp at 8.30 in the morning. I've caught a few up till around about 12 o'clock. And then if there is going to be a quiet term, it's 12 till 2. But you can be on parts of the lake where you see nothing till 6 p.m. So make sure you aren't on one of those. <laughs> Early morning is exciting times. They aren't ready for you, the carp. Other carp anglers are tucked up in the bivvies and you've just arrived, found a quiet spot and cast out a nice big lump of tiger bread. Even the ducks aren't bothered at that time. The coots and moor hens come over, get a fright. You know the carp are in the area, and sure enough, your tip goes, the bait runner screams and you're in. Early morning is the best time of the day without a doubt. Do I ever stay overnight? No, I don't. I don't see the point. It doesn't suit me. The floor's too far away for me to lay down. I can catch all the carp I need from dawn till dusk. Do I ever fish the other lakes on the complex? Not very often. I used to fish every Friday with some pals years ago. And if we came to the Oaks, we'd fish one of the match lakes. Or should I say, the pleasure angling lakes that are sometimes used for match fishing. Cedar being a typical example. These lakes are absolutely bursting with fish, so it's good for the morale. 
they have different rules and regulations so beware of what you can and can't do on all of the lakes at the Oaks just like any complex they have to have rules to make it fair for all yes I I do like to visit the other lakes and take an interest in what the match weights are. But not so often these days. How do you book at the Oaks? Go to the website, phone Tom, the owner, he'll sort it out. What are the prolific pegs? Well, we all have our favourites, but in fishing, and carp fishing especially, pegs or favourite pegs vary from season to season. So I'll split it up into winter, spring, summer, autumn. Just so we're not here all day discussing every peg. Although I would encourage you to have a look at my walk around the lake where I put my own numbers to the pegs starting at the entrance opposite the shop and the Acorn cafeteria starting at what is the west side or the west bank of the lake and I stop at every peg and look out and look around so I would encourage you to have a look at that if you want to familiarize yourself with the pegs so winter we're starting off with the hardest season of all you can even get cat ice, which is a very thin capping layer on the lake during winter. The carp are not so active in winter, so I guess you try and find where they shoaled up and you try and stimulate them into activity. Now my method of surface fishing means I'm going to get even less bites than somebody who finds them and targets them and gets them feeding on the bottom. But that's a debate for another day. pegs up the west bank starting at one predictably and going up to ten this bank is the deepest part of the lake in the far 
in the northwest corner. So think about a square shape for now, although the lake is not typically square and it has features, points and islands and overhanging bushes. So it's not square by any means but for north, south, east and west description we'll discuss it in terms of the west bank leading to the north bank leading to the east bank and finishing off at the south bank so the northwest corner one of the deepest parts of the lake the overhanging bushes if there's any left after winters took its toll that's a prolific area even in winter you get the sun coming up and stimulating the car anywhere down the west bank is going to have the sun coming up in the face in your face and it makes for a pleasurable but challenging fishing day so the northwest corner is a good starting point. On the way up the west bank we're passing prolific pegs but maybe later in the year. On the north bank we're again considering the northwest corner obviously. And I've made videos over and over about a washing line method of suspending line so that the only part touching the surface is the actual tiger bread bait. So that's another video you might want to visit at some point. Check out my channel. <laughs> On the north bank, midway along the north bank, we have the north point with an island adjacent to it and some real nice open water in front and diagonally to the right. And with a decent cast you can even target the main island of the lake diagonally right if you sat on the north point don't overlook the margins on this north point both left margin and right margin are very prolific and like all margin fishing you have to commit a rod to it and if it's behind you or out of sight you really should have a bite alarm on but give it a try move into the corner between the north bank in the east bank it's more of a curved corner so it's hard to pinpoint exactly where north ends and east bank starts but you get the picture the whole of the east bank is bathed in sunlight later in the year so save that bank for those balmy days. My favourite peg for such a sunny day as in May would be the the black.
block where the caravan is good to shower and toilet. The peg nearest to that it has the willow tree out in front and islands to the left and to the right. The left islands always promise a lot but don't always deliver. The right hand island is an awkward cast but a sad cast can be really, really useful. It's very shallow at the base of the tree on this island to the right. But it's definitely worth a shot. There's a, a gorgeous double figure common carp that swims round it. I've had it a couple of times. I've also seen it in my swim almost at my feet and that is one heck of a sight to see it, to see it jump out of the water. So that's the east bank. Moving to the south bank. In the centre of the south bank there's the point and that's a point of land stretching out into the lake with amazing margins left and right. I've had great fun to the right of the point deep in the corner very challenging but that's what carp fishing can be at some time. Very challenging, but also very rewarding. Two pegs to the left of the point was where I got my most fish in a day, personal best. It's a few years ago now, and I beat it with that peg I talked about at the shower block on the east side. But let's get back to winter. Standing on the south bank looking out to the lake, the lake used to be two lakes from the North Point to the Main Point separated the lakes. The lake right in front of us, which is the left hand lake, is the deepest part of the lake. And that can run to eight foot deep. And the right hand lake can run to five foot deep. Depending on water levels, depending on what time of year so if you are using a sick rig make sure you know how to set up an adjustable sick rig so you are actually fishing where you want to be i.e. just below the surface or on the surface or even mid water should you choose to target cruising carp. The point is that my favourite prolific peg. No, I've had some decent fish from it. I've lost some decent fish on the way in straight in front here. There's a snag that I've never been able to figure out. I end up casting to the right of the point into the willows tree. So that's a similar willows, it's the same willows tree with a similar targeting method from 
a number of different points on the lake. The left hand corner of the lake, that's where the south bank meets the west bank, just at the entrance to the lake. Now that's a prolific spot, but they are difficult to catch. I had my first 15 pound carp on my first visit to the lake one evening in May, quite a few years ago. In those days, poles were allowed to be used for fishing. And I managed to catch one and film it. Yep, that's another video you might want to see. <laughs> no poles allowed these days in carp fishing. They do occasionally catch carp in silverfish matches during the winter, but they are few and far between. And you have to be a skilled pole fisherman with the right equipment to land a carp because they can go to double figures and lead you to merry dance. I've heard it say that some of the carp look like a horse's head. So that's a fish to behold. <laughs> so that's the winter for the four banks. Moving into spring, well, the carp are going to start to wake up. Temperature rises. And anybody that fishes for carp knows that they feed a lot more readily when the temperature warms up. So bear in mind you can catch carp from every peg on the lake. It's all down to perseverance and a bit of committing a rod. Just like committing a rod to margin fishing, you have to commit a rod to a certain point on the lake if you feel that's where the carp are. For instance, targeting grass carp in spring or even autumn, they come up from nowhere and take surface baits and it's tempting to repeat that spot year after year. Bear in mind that you are always got to consider it by returning to a, a known spot. You may be just a few feet away from an even better spot if you just tried it. So if I was to suggest an option it would be a couple of year campaign fishing all the way around the lake at different points and look back on your data gathered from a first person point of view rather than secondary data i.e. somebody telling you. If you haven't got time for a couple of year campaign maybe go to the prolific spots I've suggested but good luck finding your own because that's even better, more rewarding. I've fished in the belting rain under a bush that I knew held carp 
and sure enough I caught it on film just the one but that saved a blank that day and that's a great feeling Moving around the lake in spring, well, all the margins come alive. Every one of the margins, that's from the bank to two foot out, all the way around the lake. Carp crews, especially in the evening, they're looking for, well, they used to picking up food just before they turn in for the night. So commit a rod to a margin, have a decent bite of lamb or fish within sight and consider how you're going to land it. It's no good just poking a rod through the branches of a bush and not considering how you're going to land it. Because at the end of the day, that's the target. Fish welfare and to actually land the fish. Moving from spring into summer you're going to see a lot of carp when the sun hits the northwest corner May and June you're going to see a lot of carp just sunbathing or cruising and not necessarily feeding that's up to you to stimulate that. I've described in the past at the lake seeing carp in shoals nose in to the bank just like yachts at Monaco all those amazing yachts side by side nosing to the key that's what it's like some days on Willows Lake to see those magnificent carp so close to the bank you can spook them very easily or you can catch one or two you can certainly film them but you have to be prepared so make the most of summer walk around the lake a few times during the day if you think it's gone quiet reel in, walk around see if you can spot where they are They're certainly going to be in the northwest corner. I was once visiting a friend who was fishing the shower block complex pig. And I was stood behind him on a slightly higher viewpoint. At his level, it looked just like any other part of the lake a couple of foot higher at my level stood back a bit I could see all these carp just below the surface black shadowy shapes wow I've never forgot that day he caught a few, but if he'd have adopted my surface fishing methods through tiger bread, who knows what he might have tempted. 
I've certainly had a personal best for most carp in a day from that peg on the water between you and the willows and slightly under the willows if you're able to cast to that spot. I won't go on to brag about how many I caught that day but yes there's a video and I had some friends with me and if it hadn't been for them I'd have been worn out midday so prolific pegs of all prolific pegs what had been a personal best day of most carp in a day was two pegs to the left of the point but here I was May the 20th and I was beating that personal best even to the point of catching them two at a time <laughs> my personal best mirror carp came on that day and the most carp in a day I'll end on that note I haven't touched on autumn but it's very similar to spring and remember you can catch carp from every peg on Willows Lake you just need to put the time in How do you save a blank? <laughs> There's many a carp angler wished he knew the answer to that. Well, I'm afraid you just revisit prolific pegs. If there's not many people on the lake and you can stalk or walk about or change pegs, nobody likes uprooting and moving pegs but sometimes you have to to save a blank so revisit a prolific peg <laughs> commit to it and trust that the wily carp will turn up <laughs> Is Willow's Lake good for stalking? Definitely. That's a summer and autumn routine. When there's plenty of greenery and bushes overhanging, when the willows are at the best. Everything with an overhang has the potential to hide a carp. You do need to be light footed, quiet. You do need to carry the lightest of gear, your rod, your bait and a landing net. And if you're like me, a camera. But you are committing. If you get a sense that an overhanging bush has a possibility to hide a carp or be a visiting point of a carp as it swims around in the evening, then commit to it. What have you got to lose? So yes, stalking is great when there's not many on the lake.
What does my Zigrig consist of? Well, I want a surface fished bait that I can wind under if the wildlife are too active or if a seagull or a goose takes too much of an interest. So it has to be an adjustable sea rig. So it's a, a hook, a sturdy knot, no hook length, just tie the hook direct to the main line. A couple of foot up the line have a ledger stop and a buffer bead stopping your two and a half or two and three quarter ounce pear lead from running down to the hook. And that's all it is. If you're familiar with the children's toy of loom bands, small elastic bands which they play with on multiple fingers then you know what I mean. Loom bands, especially the white, work great to hold on a big piece of tiger bread and they're just cinched onto the main line just behind the eye of the hook. I'll put up a link in the description to my Zig rig and my Freeline rig. But they are simplicity in tying and action and very efficient. So, but then again, I'm biased. <laughs>Is a grass carp take like? Well, they can explode on the surface as they take the tiger bed, shaking the head and trying to smash any line. They have the softest of mouths of any of the carp family but they know what they like. When I say soft mouths, I would always advocate you to set the hook. It's not a carp, a common carp, a ghost carp or a mirror carp where they have a bony structure around the mouth. And the, even the take can be enough to set the hook. On a grass cap, you need to, well, I advocate you need to set it. Because I've had grass cap shed the hook mid water, mid fight, even almost at my feet. We're fishing with barbless hooks and it doesn't take a lot for them to shed the hook and that's good because we don't want them going round with jewellery. So a grass carp on the surface is one of the most exciting sights in fishing in my opinion. I dare say if I ever give to fish for marlin in the far reaches of the world I might think that's exciting as well but I'll stick with trying to fill them grass carp taking off the surface coming from nowhere and exploding.
Is there a grassy alley at Willows? Yes. The fish from the west bank to the east bank and back again constantly when on the feed or cruising or sunbathing. So yes, become familiar with where you might intercept them and enjoy discovering what a grassy alley really is. Do I have any drone footage of carp cruising? Lots. Having dropped a drone in the lake a few years ago, I'm loath to hover too low to catch even better footage but I do occasionally when the lake's quiet or when I have the lake to myself I do occasionally put the drone up look for carp and try and film them I've also filmed them with my 360 camera on the end of a long pole so that's almost like drone footage. When the cap are on the surface in the sun, it's a sight to behold. It's almost, it's almost necessary to put the rod down and get the cameras out to try and capture it. Not that I ever have seen it first hand is unbeatable for me. I, I just can't put into words what it's like to see big carp cruising. I have captured footage with a Sony Handycam of the moment I realised a fish I was reeling in was a decent grass carp when that mid dorsal fin breaks the surface and you realise how far away it is from the tail <coughs> from the tail and you realise it is a grass carp then your heart rate goes up a notch <laughs> and it does take some getting over seeing magnificent grass cap on the unhooking cradle in all the glory is a fantastic sight and I'll put a picture up of one of my favourite shots of a grass cap. What part do willows trees play in finding carp? If I told you that, I'd be giving away all my secrets. <laughs> okay, come closer.
for every willow tree with branches that dangle near the surface there'll be some large carp there you've got it targeting overhanging willow trees will catch you more carp than any other method so I guess when I go to willows now I won't be able to get a peg and everybody will be targeting the big willow tree <laughs> oh dear what have I done Do I fish the margins? Definitely. That's where a lot of the carp spend the time. Margins of islands, margins around the edge. Yes, they're there. It's up to you to find a spot, commit yourself to a rod on that spot and only then can you judge whether it's worth doing again these days of using two rods you can commit a rod I know it's a wrench to not have two rods flailing about out in the lake but how are you never going to find out if you don't try it so yes fish in the margins definite way of catching carp Do you bother about depths? Well, I have used a deeper cast out and also a deeper attached to a bait boat just to drive around the lake and see what the depths are. But once you've seen them you've got the information there are deep scour points which you can occasionally come across you really need GPS coordinates to target them over and over but these scour points are where the carp feed and lay and as bait comes overhead, as my service bait does, they just come up out of the depths and bang, your bait's gone. So depth knowledge is useful, but it's not everything. Just take it as another tool in your armoury. Does water temperature matter? Definitely. If the temperature is changeable, when it gets to a certain temperature and they come on the feed, then it's obvious that that's the time to target them in a certain spot. All the temperature knowledge and depth knowledge in the world isn't worth a bean if there's no fish in front of you. So 
watch the water all the time. You'll see carp appear in the same spots year after year, season after season, month after month. When I say I've caught an 830 carp, then there you go. The water temperature must have been just right for that area. So they could be just laid there on the bottom, just waiting for the temperature to turn up. Just as you become more active when the thermostat's turned up in your house, so the carp become more active and genuinely feed or stop feeding when the water temperature rises. Can you tell when carp are spawning? Without a doubt, they're not quiet. When they're spawning, they're in the margin, thrashing away. Just leave them alone to get on with it. They don't all spawn at the same time. They do follow temperature again. So that can just switch them on or off. Late May, early June is a a time when you will see occasionally spawning. Pack up your gear, move, or even move to a different lake or a different venue. Leave them to it. When they're spawning, they're not feeding anyway, so you're not going to catch them. Just leave them to it. How do I fish the point? I've said to Tom many times I really need to use 16 rods there's that much choice <laughs> but I'm stuck with two rods so the strategy has to revolve around that two rods. Targets. If we forget about the margins and the very tip of the point, because it's hard to fish so close in when there's all that water and all those targets out in front. If we if, so if we don't consider the margins, then there's an island to our left, an aerator to our left, close proximity to both, and we'll catch carp. There's a spot between the island and the north point almost 45 degrees to your left so aiming towards the northwest corner but midway between you and the northwest corner and there's some amazing channels in that area and if nobody's fishing the northwest corner or the west bank you can fish right out there from a different point of view i.e. from the point
moving round clockwise if there's nobody on the point or north point should I say then you can cast and I've seen big carp feeding very close in to the north point when there's nobody there but it's committing a rod to a margin we all like to cast to the horizon there's something I don't know ancient a prime evil about casting a long way <laughs> moving round there's an island thinking about the clock face if we stood on the tip of the point on the south bank there's an island at about two o'clock on the clock face and casting to that margin you'll see some what I would call zoo creatures not to be taken lightly it is a cast where you can be proud of your achievement if you hit the same spot repeatedly because eventually you will catch moving round we see the willows tree overhanging now this is from a different perspective but it's still as exciting as anywhere else on the lake between us and the willows tree there's a small island to our right Cap I've been known to swim around that island if you ever catch one then that's where they go I've seen lovely ghost carp take people around the island and drop the hoop to the far right almost behind us there's a bay and there's decent carp visit that but when you stood on the point and there's so much water in front of you it's very hard to ignore and fish a dark and overhanging bay but the carp are there it's just a case of fishing for them So that's how I fish the point without the use of 16 rods. <laughs>
Sometimes fishing into the wind can bring the fish to you. What is tow and what is drift? Freeline bait is affected by drift. That's the surface of the water being pushed along by any movement of the water, including wind which blows it across the lake and when it hits the far bank it turns on itself and it comes back sometimes as tow an undercurrent how does tow affect it well it's a consideration but it, it's not mandatory that you understand completely what tour is happening on any particular time of day. Just be aware that the faster the surface is moving, the faster the tour is. And we're told that there are very various layers of warmth or coldness in the levels of a lake then the deeper the water the difference is going to be greater i.e. in the eight foot areas of the lake you're going to find a difference in temperature between the surface and mid-water and sometimes that can be where the carp are so identifying that should you choose to fish a mid-water rig or zig then that's where you would find this warm layer it's not being cooled by the cold wind on the surface and the cold lower area of the lake. That mid-water may well be a couple of degrees warmer and worth a try with a zig. So that's a not very comprehensive <coughs> but a guide to what toys and what drift is.
how to avoid crayfish when bottom fishing. Lift your bait up off the bottom is the answer. That can be a short zig, a pop up boily, or even a wafter. Crayfish can swim upwards, but if you make it difficult for them, then you'll have less of a problem. You can always use armour mesh, not to be confused with PVA mesh. PVA mesh melts in the water, armour mesh doesn't. And so you get a, a bait still being intact, still being attractive, but being armour against any crayfish. Moor hens, coots and ducks. Moor hens and coots. Encourage them to be your pals. They are eyes and ears when on the water looking for carp. If you see a coot or a moor hen moving towards your surface bait and then suddenly turn away, get ready for a take. There's a carp in the area. If you see coots and moor hens having a meal of, of your surface bait and they suddenly take off like a helicopter, yep. There's a carp in the area. Moor hens and coots don't eat much. Sometimes have chicks to feed. So take the live and let live approach and let them have what they need. As long as they leave enough to attract the carp, then that's not a problem. If you're fishing the margin, they will try and drag your surface bait on the land. That's not going to catch any fish, so dissuade them from that. They will come backwards and forwards vast distances across the lake. So give a little, let them have a little long as they leave some for the carp. Keep using them as bite alarms. If you ever hook one by accident, when you reel it in after a, a lot of carry on, squawking, cover them with a towel while you unhook them, because they do have sharp claws and you wouldn't want to damage anything on them and then return them to the water they'll be ever so grateful ducks well they learn that if they approach something with a visible hook it's best avoided Certain times of the year they're more hungry than others, they have a brood of chicks to feed, and so they take a chance. Yes, I have hooked a duck. You drag it in, you unhook it easily with a barbless hook. You put it back on the water, off it goes to its mates, and the first thing it says is, 
leave his bread alone, it's got hooks in it. So that's their good deed for the day. You've unhooked it carefully and put it back in the water and they've spread the word and they'll leave you alone as long as it's that squadron on the water. If a new squadron from an uh, from another lake appears, then he may have to go through the learning process all again. But over a season you'll find that they don't go for your surface bait half as much as they did when they had chicks, so live and let live. Well, that covers the question and answer session. I'll add some links to videos in the description. Recommended videos that I've taken over the years. You might get some tips from it. You recognise some of the peg numbers from my description and certainly if you've watched the walk around the lake where I give pegs a numbering system which isn't actually the same numbering system as the silverfish competitors use during November to March, they have their own numbering system, so when I talk about a peg number, it's my peg numbering system. It would be nice if we all adopted the same one, but c'est la vie. I also, I'll include some stills of nice looking carp to encourage you links to gear I use. So I hope you enjoyed this long session. I wanted to cover as much as I could. So bye for now. Leave a comment. I love you reading your comments. Especially the positive ones. <laughs> if you like this video, give it a like. If you're not keen on it, give it two dislikes. <laughs> Catch you later.